So, when I first uh, heard of Sovereign Health and the, uh, the, uh, the program that Dr. Sharma had developed, I thought that bringing mindfulness meditation to a program like this would have a profound impact on patients' lives. And that marrying this idea of brain wellness and meditation could really potentially transform people's lives. Now, in any program like this, drug and alcohol program, I want to fundamentally say that the 12 steps is the foundation of a program for transforming your life. And as I was speaking to Mr. Smith, Larry Smith earlier, uh, anytime I've had a conversation with someone in drug and alcohol, they always bring up the serenity prayer. And the first part of the serenity prayer, of course, is God, give me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. And I always ask, how do you do that? Those are great words, but how do you go about accepting things you can't change? This may come naturally to some people, but most people, it's you worry. If you can't change it, and something's happening, you're going to worry about it. And you're going to worry and worry and worry and worry yourself into oblivion and ulcer or whatever. So the idea is that meditation infuses this idea from the spiritual side up, and it gives it meaning because you're practicing in the state of meditation, a profound state of just surrendering to what is. And that's as simple as it can be. Meditation is the act of surrender. Uh, and it's, it's a learned skill. This is not something, we all vary according to how easy it is to learn. We all vary about how easy it is to ride a bike, or how easy it is to play the piano. Meditation and this idea of surrender is a learned skill that requires practice. So it isn't like some mystical uh, condition that I can sprinkle gold dust over you or fairy dust and all of a sudden you're in nirvana or some state of grace. It really is a practice state. And in, a, in, in effect, it is actually a trick. It's a balancing act. And the trick is to balance your brain and allow your consciousness to unfold inside and around what thinking in the brain is doing. And so it is really an idea that uh, requires uh, quietness, of course, and sitting in a state of um, uh, where there's not a lot of uh, what are supposed distractions, or you may consider them distractions, uh, and then using a center device for the brain. Now, meditations basically all vary according to what you use as a center device. So there are meditations called mantra meditations, which you repeat a word over and over and over to yourself. It can be a word that you make up. Often there are Sanskrit words or words you don't understand, or just syllabic sounds that you're repeating to yourself over and over. You can use guided imagery. Guided imagery to put yourself in a state where you're imaging this uh, state of serenity and grace and, and, and a pleasant sensation, and you literally feel the wind on your face. You smell the smells that you would smell. You put all of your senses into this whatever state of, uh, of being comfortable. There are meditations of focusing on uh, flames. There are meditations of um, uh, listening to the sound of uh, high-pitched bells or ringing. And it says uh, meditation on what's called a Zen bowl bell, which is a very highly honed bell that is tapped and the pitch goes up and then it comes down. And just sitting and listening to that creates kind of a meditative state of just surrendering to the sound. Well, mindfulness meditation is probably the simplest of all meditations and the most available to anybody. Now, I don't know where all of you are in terms of your concepts of meditation and what this is, uh, but I, just on a very simplistic level, I want to say that um, if you compare meditation to prayer, prayer would be the act of talking to God. Okay, Meditation would be the act of listening and listening to whatever. It doesn't necessarily mean God, and I don't, I don't want to put God out there. That word is too big to, uh, to try and infuse with meditation. So... Meditation literally is the act of surrendering to what is and simply being aware and listening to whatever happens for the time that you're spending in that meditative state. And when you start to do that and you start to relax, a few deep breaths, you feel your body, you feel how you feel emotionally, what's going on with you that day, almost kind of like taking your internal temperature for that day. Uh, and as you feel yourself relaxing, you take a few deep breaths and relax. The first thing you're going to notice, typically, is your brain starts to think. And your brain, of course, thinking all the whole time. And when I teach anyone meditation, initially, I always say, the first thought will be, what the hell am I doing here sitting meditating? I mean, what, what is the point? Uh, and so 
as the brain starts to think, thought to thought to thought to thought to thought, it's often like going to bed at night and going to sleep, where your brain is just kind of on cruise control. And oftentimes, if there's a lot of anxiety, you don't fall asleep. You can't stop that process of obsessive compulsive brain thought patterns chasing its tail like a hamster in a cage. So, in the meditative state, you allow that to happen. There's, you're, you're not trying to concentrate, you're not trying to focus, you allow your brain to chase its tail. And then when you find your brain and you get tired of watching the brain chasing its tail, you simply bring yourself to a center point. And with mindfulness meditation, the center is nothing more than feeling the rise and the fall of your chest as your body is breathing. And the beauty of this center point, this is a rhythm you're breathing. And we all have different little variation on that rhythm, but we all have a specific rhythm. And listening and watching and being witness to the body's rhythm is very, very powerful. It's uh, relaxing, almost like being hypnotized and watching a, a watch swing back and forth. And meditation is often compared to hypnosis, and I honestly believe that it's the same kind of uh, mental attitude and mental uh, condition is evolving, whether you're being hypnotized or meditating, it's just someone else is doing it to you. Uh, Self-hypnosis is another type. Self-hypnosis is exactly the same, the, the same as meditation in my mind. Um, so as you sit with your breathing and you watch your body breathing, you feel kind of a sense of a, a center point. And initially what will happen is that you'll get an itch on your face and your attention will go to the itch off of your breathing. Or the garbage trucks will drive by and you'll listen to the garbage trucks. Or your brain will start to think, or your wife will walk across the room, or your little girl will run up and stand up in the chair and go, <laughs> and stare at you, wondering what the hell you're doing. Uh, and so all of these things come into your experience in the 15 or 20 minutes that you're sitting there. And this isn't a distraction. This is the meditation. Everything that comes to your consciousness is part of the meditative state. So whatever happens in that 15 to 20 minutes, if you think the entire time and you never sit with your breathing and follow your breathing, that is your meditation. So the act of sitting and watching your body breathing, feeling the rise and fall of your chest, the way the air feels as it goes in your nose, and there's a pause, and then there's a temperature change, and the air comes out of your nose, and there's a pause. And there's a difference in the length of the in-breath and the length of the out-breath. But there's a rise and fall. Now, here's how I like to describe the transformative effect of meditation. This is a rhythm that you're experiencing. It's a natural rhythm. In the natural world, there are infinite number of rhythms going on every moment of every minute, every day, all the time. Your electrons are spinning around uh, atomic particles, creating molecular structures that develop into proteins that will then cause nerve transmission and may cause a mental activity that may cause a sensation. And this is all happening in a rhythm. So I kind of equate those natural rhythms to the idea that there's a symphony going on all the time but you can't hear it because we're not paying attention to it. We're not being quiet enough to recognize the symphony that's going on all the time. It's in me, it's in you, it's in the natural world. And it's literally, we can describe it in physical terms and look at string theory and look at these energy packets vibrating at extremely high rates, creating what looks like mass. And then mass creating what looks like Larry and me and you and you and you and the cabinet and the chairs. So this symphony is going on all the time, although it's not an auditory thing, it's a thought, it's, a, it's something that you experience. And following your breathing is the only rhythm you have that will guide you as you deeply watch your body breathe into this symphony. It's as if you can only hear one instrument, but as you listen to that instrument, it opens up the entire symphony, and you start to see the state that occurs in your body all the time. You start to feel it. This isn't a thinking thing, by the way. This is a feeling. This is an experience. I often say, look, if I were to tell you that Argentina is a neat place to go, well, then go there and see if you like it. Well, they the same with meditation. You, know, you can believe anything. You can be atheist, agnostic. This isn't about the, the, the brain function. In fact, this is about eventually letting the brain stop thinking. 